Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It is a huge episode 37. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as usual, the man with a plan, Mr. Chad Owen, joins us from Brooklyn. Good morning, sir. Good evening, Sydney. So we're here at the end of the Apple series, Mike. Did you ever think that we would get here? Oh, and and we should let everybody know a, a secret that we were considering one more after this one, but we had some sort of revelation and some sort of moment of clarity and held ourselves back. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of fun bringing you insights from no fewer than five Apple insiders through the years, going back to the founders, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. If you remember, we did uh, in our design series, Jonathan Ivey. Um, mm-hmm. We've also kicked off this kind of latest run with Angela Ahrens. And then we come to today's show. Mike, who are we profiling today? Well, w- the man who gets things done is, I think, the the appropriate label here. It's none other than Mr. Tim Cook, who is a bit of a special character. I mean, let's just remember this one thing. He followed Steve Jobs. I mean, can mm. you ever, like, that's one job where you're probably thinking, I uh, will never do better than the guy that came before me. Like, oh, it's, uh, it must have been so overwhelming, don't you think? Yeah, I think it, it's very unfortunate, especially in doing research for this show. I don't think he can escape any interview without the interviewer asking him, so how are you, how's your legacy going to be different than Steve's? Or right. how do you, you know, How's Apple different under you? Or yeah. just, the, the poor guy is just never going to come out from under Steve Jobs' shadow. And if he wasn't such a diplomat, you could just imagine going, enough already. Stop with the Steve Jobs stuff. My name is Tim Cook. Would you stop with that? We've actually made a few trillion dollars since I've been here. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you, I mean, if you look at the kind of absolute growth numbers, like ugh, under Tim Cook, it's just completely insane. It's like, you know, yes, Steve uh, did come back to the company, revitalize it, you know, prodigal son mm-hmm. returns. But um, I think, you know, if you look at just kind of total t- dollars in, in profits generated, Tim Cook has done a really great job. Absolutely. And uh, he is. He's a he's a special character because uh, what we're going to discover is not only is he this operational guru, right? He's built one of the world's best supply chains, without a doubt. But he's got some pretty sharp observations on how to think about you know managing large organizations. Like Apple is the largest company by market capitalization on the planet. They're going to be at a trillion very soon. I mean, we're recording this show. And just yesterday, they announced their earnings. And in what is meant to have been a quiet quarter, they crushed it. And they just seem to be, a, I mean, they seem to be able to sell iPhones for any price they want. It is ridiculous. And we've got lots to learn as well because he's, uh, he's got some powerful mental models on how he approaches uh, running one of the world's most prestigious companies, uh, a company that builds things that for most of us, we're working with their products daily, hourly. I I was surprised to see how much breadth there is in what he's had to share and what we can bring to the show. How are you feeling about, you know, when we, we said we'd do Tim Cook, how did you feel about it? And what, what, do you, what do you feel about Tim Cook now that you've done, you've prepped all the clips, you've started to, to think about what he has to offer us, Chad? What can we expect in the next hour from, from Tim Cook, do you think? Well, one of the things you won't hear on the show, which is a little unfortunate because it's kind of my favorite part of Tim Cook is just kind of his outspoken activism on really the most important issues of of today, things like global warming and immigration and, you know, diversity and inclusion. We were just talking, you know, before we hit record that he is still the only openly gay uh, CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And the largest company in the world in, in that regards. And mm, he, mm. you know, he's very outspoken and um, seems like everyone wants to know his opinion on, on issues and uh, hoping, hoping that he can lend kind of some of his, uh, his power to, you know, what's happening in the world. But, you know, 
while it is great to see him doing all of that, it, you know, it's, it's a little kind of tangen- tangential to, to what we're doing here uh, on the Moonshots podcast. But I found his, his kind of explanation of how he gets things done inside of Apple to be really informative and a nice contrast to kind of the founding story heavy yeah. uh, material that we got from Steve Jobs and everything that we know about Steve and kind of just his if, and and thinking differently. Like I think Tim Cook does think differently but not in the same way that Steve Jobs did. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh the big the big gift I think we have on this show is that this guy is an operator. He's meticulous. He gets things done. And uh, you, we all know those paradigms of it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Well, this guy is doing a whole lot of perspirating. He is getting the job done. He ships the phones. He might not be the world's greatest product designer, but he's certainly done a good job of gathering amazing talent around the company and steering through what would have been just a uh, an enormous challenge, a weight on your shoulders to to run the company that Steve Jobs founded. And I and I think he's just a standout leader. And I think there's lots of good things. Even if you're running a small startup, there there's a lot to learn from Tim Cook, who's running what Steve Jobs was calling in the show, <laughs> uh, the world's biggest startup, you know. So, so much uh, to look forward to here. And I think... Uh, Chad, where should everybody go if they want to get show notes, they want to follow up on links and ideas and things that we mentioned? Yep. So if you're just dropping into the podcast now, you'll find the rest of our series on Apple Innovators uh, at moonshots.io. You'll also find all of our other popular episodes. I think our Lady Gaga episode just just topped every everything else out in terms of, of listens. Yeah. So be sure to go back yeah. and, and check out our, our back catalog. You can find everything at Moonshots. Io. Yes, and I must kind of uh, endorse your recommendation for the Gaga show. She is what was her thing? Re- you know, courageous and relentless was the the call out that she had for for living mm-hmm. her dreams and and creating one of the big pop icons of a generation. So definitely tap into that. But where should we start tapping into the world of Tim Cook, Chad? What what have you got for us first? Well, we just uh, got a, a fun little intro clip here from uh, uh, at the start of a Bloomberg interview that Tim Cook did, just to kind of get all of you caught up with some of his, you know, small uh, recent achievements. It's been nearly six years since Tim Cook took over for Apple's iconic co-founder, Steve Jobs. And each year, the company becomes more Cook's own. He's unveiled the Apple Watch and Apple Music. He pulled off the largest acquisition in Apple's history, buying Beats. He's taken on issues like the environment, philanthropy, equality, and education. He stood up to President Obama on user privacy and maintains a dialogue with President Trump despite their disagreement on climate change. What a classy act. He he doesn't even necessarily agree with Trump policies, but he doesn't walk away from the table. He's still there talking and making things happen. I mean, when I heard that, I just thought statesman, Chad. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. That's actually a, a great way to describe him and kind of, again, contrast him to uh, here. We're doing it. I'm doing it here on the show, contrasting him to, to <laughs> Steve Jobs. But um, it really it really is a different era for the company. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Um, he certainly has some challenges in, in terms of just the pure product innovation that I think came so naturally under Steve's direction. But when you're when you're making hundreds of billions of dollars, <laughs> Like you're gonna you're gonna be able to spend enough on R and D to come out with some interesting products. Yeah, yeah, that, that, they'll get there. I think the path is is a little bit more iterative rather than slam dunk when they just come out of the uh, out of the starting line. That was, I mean, signature Steve. But what's really interesting is he was a seasoned exec at at IBM, and he came to the company at a time when most would have said. I wouldn't touch Apple with a barge pole. I mean, Apple was in big trouble when he came there. And, you know, Tim Cook talks about a lot of his personal uh, friends um, and confidants when he shared with them, oh, I'm thinking of going to Apple. What now looks like obvious, of course you would, at the time was far from obvious. People were like, are you crazy? That company's about to run out of cash. It's a mess. And yet 
he did it. And and I think that's one of the most surprising things about him that at the time most people said you're crazy, but he did it anyway. And actually, well, and Angela Arnes's you know friends and advisors told her the very same thing when she was that's right. Uh, leaving that's Burberry. right. That's right. Um, and what's really interesting is just how different Apple was as an organization, forgetting all their financial issues at the time, how different it was uh, to IBM. And we've got this great, great little snippet from, from Tim Cook kind of really expressing how liberating it was when he started out at, at Apple and many, many years ago. But, but let's take a listen to Tim Cook and how he explains the feeling of when you, he started to work at Apple and to get some momentum. So you go there, and what is your job at Apple? Uh, running worldwide operations. And um, the, the company at that time was struggling uh, in many different areas, and, and operations was no different. Our economies of scale uh, didn't lend itself uh, to us doing manufacturing in, in different places like we, like. Uh, existed in the company at that time. And so we found partners that were expert at manufacturing, and we maintained the sort of the intellectual knowledge of how, the process, and obviously all of the uh, design of, of the product. Now, when you got there and you're working for, um, uh, for Steve, was it better than you thought, worse than you thought, more challenging than you thought? I found it to be liberating, is the way I would describe it, because it's uh, you could you could kind of talk to Steve about something very big, and uh, if it resonated with him, he would just say okay, and it, you could do it. And so it was like a you know like a total revelation for me that a company could run like this uh, because I was used to these layers and bureaucracy and studies and you know, studying things, uh, sort of the paralysis that companies can get into. And uh, Apple was totally different than that. And I realized that if I couldn't get something done, I could just go to the nearest mirror and look at it. And that was the reason. Mm. It's such an interesting personal re reflection yeah. from him that the only thing standing in the way of, of the company in progress and himself is himself. Yeah. And it would have felt so different because you've got to remember he is 12 years at IBM and did a quick stint at Compaq. So he'd come from like classic corporate America. It would have been quite jarring and, and it almost makes you think to yourself, geez, what fortitude he must have demonstrated just to adjust. And, and let's be honest, once you've done 10 years at IBM, forget the rest, 10 years there to go to somewhere very, very different and make it work. What a testament to, to his ability to adapt and to grow and to change because I don't know if I'm even up for that, you know? Yeah, I don't know that I could last six months in a company like IBM, but he's been at Apple twice as long as he was at IBM. So I'm pretty sure all the last vestiges of uh, the <laughs> IBM have been, have been whittled, whittled away. He, the gray suits are gone. The big blue is out. And uh, he's totally, totally liberated. Yeah, I, I just think it's it's a testament to his uh, flexibility and his ability to learn and embrace something different, which says so much about his character. And now that he has kind of broken through at this point in time at Apple, I think it's 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 really remarkable to to understand the platform that he put in place, not just for his career, but I think you can argue that a lot of what he did was the actual foundation from which Steve, Jonathan Ive, and all those other people could build amazing products and services and hardware. And it was all coming back to this infrastructure, this operational excellence, supply chain, what he calls the economies of scale, which gave them the ability to get better prices for components, to be faster to market. Lots and lots and lots of benefits. All of these came from what he put in place because Apple was notorious for, for low margins uh, towards the period where um, Steve was out 
They were running out of cash. They were slow. And everything changed once the infrastructure from Tim was combined with Steve's genius. So let's let's jump into this next clip because I think this really establishes what the scale of his achievement has been. So here is what five years of Tim Cook will do to jazz up Apple Inc. Milestone for the top man at Apple, CEO Tim Cook marks his fifth year anniversary at the helm of the world's most valuable company. Now to mark the occasion, we take a look back at Cook's tenure. Bloomberg's Pia Godkari reports. In August 2011, Tim Cook was taking over from a legend. Many investors feared that without Steve Jobs at the helm, Apple would be headed for decline. But now, five years on, Cook has defined Apple in his own ways. First off, business boomed under Cook's leadership. Apple's market cap doubled, surpassing ExxonMobil to become the world's most valuable company. But the stock has lagged the Nasdaq 100 since Cook was named CEO. In March 2012, under pressure from activist shareholder Carl Icahn, Cook granted shareholders their first dividend in 17 years, plus a $10 billion buyback scheme. Company data shows Apple's cash holdings nearly doubled, from $121 billion to $232 billion. But with 93% of that money held offshore, Cook has taken heat from regulators and the US Senate, accusing Apple of using subsidiaries in Ireland to reduce its tax bill. Now to product. Under Tim Cook, Apple's story is still all about the iconic iPhone. In July, Apple sold its billionth unit and the category accounts for nearly 57% of Apple's revenue. But investors are waiting on another major product win, especially since the company has seen iPhone revenues decline for the first time ever in the first two quarters of this year. Some investors think Apple is over-dependent on the iPhone and worry about the impact of cooling demand in China. And then there's Tim Cook, the person. In October 2014, Cook became the most high-profile, openly gay executive in the US and has since become a public advocate for the LGBT community. He's also taken a stand on privacy, facing off with the FBI in a very public confrontation over iPhone encryption. And Cook is pushing Apple's green credentials, hiring former EPA head Lisa Jackson, funding renewable power sources for the company's data centers, and setting ambitious recycling targets for Apple's old devices. With Tim Cook hitting his stride, let's see what Apple's next five years will look like. So I just want to like re- rewind there. My my head almost exploded there. One mm. billion iPhones shipped. Yeah. One billion. Like, I can't even imagine what one billion iPhones looks like. <laughs> well, we don't even have 10 million, 10 billion people on the planet. So I don't know. I reckon there's some, some iPhone hoarding going on there. But the, the thing that, that made me reflect on most, Chad, was if you think about all the crazy stuff that's happened in the last five, six years, and some of the challenges that he took on once he became CEO, it's actually been a pretty smooth run for for Apple. And if you want to contrast that, think about what Facebook's been going through. Think about some of the billion-dollar fines that Google has received from uh, the EU recently. Apple's done a pretty tidy job, thanks in part to Tim. They've really kind of avoided a lot of... Yeah, they've steered clear for sure. Don't you reckon? Yeah, and I think it's because Tim Cook himself is just so outspoken and enjoys and, you know, I think uses for good kind of his profile as the leader of the biggest company uh, in in the world. I think I want to go back to this billion iPhones thing because (laughs) because because you're right. He architected the systems that allowed Apple to ship a billion iPhones and have more money in cash than the market caps of probably 95% of companies in, you know, across the globe. It's just, um, it's just mind boggling mm-hmm. that the numbers, when you yeah. talk about any numbers at, at Apple yeah. in, in recent years. And I think his, like, I would argue that under Tim Cook's tenure, Apple has, has moved away from this kind of evergreen startup that Steve Jobs thought of it as in that, because in my definition of, of kind of startups, like you're still trying to find business, you know, a business model that 
that can scale. Mm. I think what Tim Cook has done has been like, you know what? Steve Jobs really nailed it with the iPhone, the iPad, and 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 the App Store and, and iTunes. And he's like, I'm just gonna optimize this and sc- <laughs> scale the wazoo out of it. And you know, like like it was in in that clip. You know, he doubled the market cap in in uh, you know under his tenure. And so that that's what's really interesting to me is how it was such a great yeah hire in in the late 90s and promotion of Tim Cook into that position to realize that hey, if we really want to continue the growth of this company, we're going to have to put a, a fundamentally different kind of person at the helm. Yeah, yeah. It was a big call and a good one. I mean, it's really interesting to think, we, we talked about it, how risky going to Apple in the first place was. But if you think about it, it would have been equally tumultuous and stressful to go from being you know, the right-hand man to Steve Jobs to becoming the new Steve Jobs. So we've got this great clip that talks to not only uh, the supply chain that he built, but that moment where Steve hands the reins over to Tim Cook. So let's have a listen to the moment. The time of transition from Steve Jobs as leader of Apple to Tim Cook was an incredibly charged moment, very close to his own death. He said to Tim Cook, I don't ever want you to ask, what would Steve Jobs do? I want you to do what is right. And here it is. None of the genius that is attributed to Steve Jobs would ever been able to happen had it not been for the supply chain that Tim Cook built. And when he started, there wasn't much of a supply chain. Apple actually made a lot of its own products. Then Tim Cook dismantled that, he began to assemble an amazing sort of chain of suppliers. Apple would deeply, deeply integrate with these suppliers, going way up river to fundamental technologies so that they would be the first in line to get them and they would be made to the standards that Apple wanted. The combination of all those things gave Apple an advantage that to this day, no other electronics company has and it's very hard to imagine that anyone ever would. The Apple Watch is the most advanced timepiece ever created. To say, oh, Cook hasn't come out with an amazing groundbreaking product like Steve Jobs has, well, the climate isn't quite ready for that to happen. Things like the iPhone, the iPad, the iPod were the product of the right moment when memory became affordable and processors became more energy efficient and display technology reached a certain point that you could start to actually make those products. Mm. I think, Again, kind of reflecting on how his different leadership style was right for Apple, I think this really kind of digs into probably what Tim Cook's unique genius is, and it was designing this new supply chain for Apple. I don't think that it could have the margins that it has today if mm. they were continuing to manufacture their their own products. Absolutely. And what a can you imagine the sigh of relief? If you're Tim Cook and and Steve says to you, hey, dude, don't try and be me. It's okay. Just do your own thing. I mean, you'd just be like, oh, I'm glad you said that because you would just be thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't produce an iPod, an iPad, an iPhone, MacBook. Like you'd just be thinking, I don't have that in me. And he's like, that's cool. You do your own thing. And I think that that would have just given you so much confidence as, as Tim Cook taking on uh, such a prominent uh, prominent role, but I think what we've done now is we've really we've really set the scene uh, for for Tim Cook. I, I think it's really important that we kind of share some of the things that he does to perform at such a high level. And you know, Apple really does. I mean, when you want to think about uh, supply chains, they're often evaluated as one of, if not the best supply chain in the world, which is pretty good when you do some of the best products in the world too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's massive. It scales products like hardware, service, services, soft, uh, software. I mean, there is a lot going under on under the hood. We mentioned the acquisition of Beats. So can you imagine how lost you could get just, I don't know, answering emails at Apple. Can you imagine how many emails this guy gets a day? <laughs> Not as many as uh, probably Mark Zuckerberg, but yeah, he probably gets quite probably a few. close. Um, so I think it's really fascinating to see how he gets great people around him, 
and and how he approaches it. And I love the clarity that he brings to this. And this is a big lesson for us, big or small, you need to have your company, if it's big or small, it doesn't matter. You need to have a clear hierarchy, a clear framework, if you will, on what you're going to focus on. And uh, focus is a specialty with Tim Cook. And Yeah, and, and building strong teams, another theme that we've heard across many of the shows here. And the clips here kind of in the second half of the show, we're, we're going to deconstruct and, and hear from Tim and some of the strategies that he has used at his tenure at Apple and, and, and some of the day-to-day ways that he gets things done. And then kind of towards the end of the show, we'll dive into some of his more kind of uh, personal mental models that, that he uses and, uh, and have some inspirational clips for, for us. But this, this next one, I think, is a great high-level overview of how Tim kind of sees and runs and kind of organizes the way he, d- he does things at Apple. Um, and he's got three priorities, and I'll just let him speak to that himself. When I became dean, one of the first conversations I had was with you. And you told me that I needed to focus on at most three things. When you think about your job as CEO, what, what are the two or three things that you're thinking about every day? This is what I need to focus on within the company. I, I spend almost all of my time on people, strategy, and execution. And I think that most everything else falls from those. If you have the most uh, brilliant people, wicked smart people that, that collaborate well together, if you set the, pro- in our case, we're all about products. So our strategy is very product oriented. If that strategy is right, and if you're executing like crazy, uh, there, uh, there are some things that still arise, but if you get those three right, then uh, the world is a great place. So fascinating that you don't hear technology, you don't hear marketing or market share or competitors, people, strategy, execution. I thought that was just very crisp and you just get a sense, the way he talks about that, you know he's on top of it and he is giving his utmost to those three areas. I wonder if all of our listeners were to ask themselves now, have they got their big three nice and clear and are they spending the the right amount of time on those big three? Is it like 50% or do they have like a big six or seven or eight or nine? I think this is just a powerful lesson in focus and prioritization. Don't you, Chad? Yeah. I, I think the only person that beats him here is Jeff Bezos and yeah. just his mantra for being completely customer obsessed. Yeah. That's his that's his one priority. So you know, <laughs> Jeff has it down 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 to one. But I, I don't want to gloss over kind of your call to action here, Mike, because I think it is in our entrepreneurial spirit to be distracted and yes. pulled in a million yes. different directions. I think if I put myself on the spot here, I don't know what my what my three uh, mm. what my three things would be. You know, I, I would have to take some time to to think about it. But I think it's a, a fascinating insight that we in the outside think, oh my gosh, like it must be the craziest job in the world to run a company as huge as Apple. But in in Tim's mind, it's like, nope, it's just about people, strategy, and execution. And if I can, you know, be the steward of those three things inside of the company, we're going to be really successful. And, I mean, the numbers don't lie. <laughs> That's true. But there was a little tell in that that was really powerful. What he suggested is if you get those three right, they're of the highest order and everything else will, I think his words were like fall out of that or something of that nature. And so that was re- the, the power of this insight is if I get these three right, almost everything else works out. So he knows that the right choice of technology, the right marketing will happen if he has the right people executing the strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, there's a clip that we didn't include, but he kind of dives into the strategy more. He, he says, yeah, well, yeah, we're a product focused company. And I think he would go on to say that, like, if you get, if you make things that people want, which we've heard from so many other uh, yeah. yes. people from the show, then everything else will follow. If you, if you make something that people want, yeah. the money will follow, yeah. the great talent will follow, you know, the innovation yeah. will, will, will follow from that. And so, I think I, I think those three strategies are are, are really fantastic uh, to take away. 
Yeah, and he's just going to come at us now with a whole bunch of really thoughtful little nuggets. Um, this next one is is all about the fact that if you've got the people, the strategy, and the execution, that's that's a great playbook. But it's all about getting the right talent to get the job done. So let's have a listen to him now talking about finding collaborators and what he looks for trying to find the perfect Apple employee. You look for for people that uh, are not political, people that are not uh, bureaucrats, people that really don't care who gets credit, people that are can privately celebrate the achievement, but not care if their name is the one in the lights, uh, you know, that, that there, are other, there are greater reasons to do things. You look for wicked smart people. You look for people who appreciate different points of view. Uh, you look for people that care enough that they have an idea at 11 at night and they want to call and talk to you about it uh, because they're so excited about it and they want to push the idea further and that they believe that somebody can help them push the idea another step instead of them doing everything themselves. You know, I've never, I've never met anyone, in, at least in my life, maybe they exist, uh, that could do something so incredible by themselves. You know, in, in companies with global footprints and, and uh, in, in our world, in, in Apple's world, the, the reason Apple is special is that we focus on hardware, software, and services, and the magic happens where those three come together. And so it's unlikely that somebody that's focused on one of those in and of themselves can come up with magic. And so you want people collaborating uh, in such a way that you can produce these things that can't be produced otherwise. And you want people to believe in that. Wow, wow, wow. It was just all about humble team players. That was the formula that I heard. Yeah, and and apolitical, non-bureaucrats. This Mm -hmm. is the second time we've heard him say wicked smart. And the other thing too is like, you know, people that get excited about ideas. I think that's listening to customers and then getting excited about the things that they share with you. Like, yeah, that, that's how you Mm -hmm. get these interesting products to market. And I think, you know, he rightly identifies, I think what Apple, the company's, you know, where the magic is at the intersection of hardware, software, and services. Oh yeah. That was great. Wasn't it? It's an interesting distillation of like what separates Apple from the rest. Yeah, it totally does. Now, you, what was interesting is you mentioned ideas there, and I think that's central not only to Tim Cook, but you will remember that came up a lot mm-hmm. uh, in our investigation of Steve Jobs. But what was really interesting is if we rewind back to the moment where Apple announced it was going to buy Beats, there was a lot of puzzled people in the world. And it was very unusual because it was such a big acquisition. And, and Apple traditionally has always done very small, very tactical, often very technology-driven acquisitions to, you know, put into Tim's supply chain. But Well, and, and lots of, of partnerships yes, in that yes. regard too, not, not outright acquisitions. That's right, yeah, and Intel being one of the most controversial ones at the time. But what's really fascinating is that how – the biggest acquisition didn't happen under Steve Jobs, but it actually happened under Tim Cook. Yeah, well, we have a, a great we have a great clip uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, on on why they purchased Beats. In Beats, what we saw is several things. We saw talent, a t- talent that uh, I'm super impressed with, uh, Jimmy and Dre, off the char- off the charts, creative geniuses. Uh, they also had teams underneath them that I really liked. Uh, Jimmy has a deep knowledge of the musical industry. Dre knows artists. Dre is an artist. And they had started a a subscription service. Mm -hmm. And this subscription service, you know, some people think they're all alike. Well, let me tell you, I I went into the thing skeptically. Into the acquisition? Not to the acquisition, into their service. Because Jimmy had told me how great it was. And so 
one night I'm sitting playing with theirs versus some others, and all of a sudden it dawns on me that when I listen to theirs for a while, I feel completely different. And the reason is that they recognized that human curation was important in the subscription service, that the sequencing of songs that you listen to affect how you feel. Mm -hmm. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you feel it. Mm -hmm. and, and so that night, I couldn't sleep that night. And so I was thinking, We've, we need to do this. They also have, I think, they've done a fabulous job with their brand and in the, the headphone business. It's a fast-growing business. They went into it not too long ago and, you know, have done really well. However, they needed a global footprint. We have a global footprint. They, they have been primarily U.S., not solely U.S., but primarily U.S. And so I felt we could get a subscription service. We could get incredible talent and that I think we can all put our heads together and do some things that are beyond what either of us are currently doing. And we could get a fast-growing business. Yeah, I uh, I love this clarity of vision. He saw talent and he saw growth. And um, what's really fascinating is it doesn't seem to have been a, a zero sum game when we look at you know iTunes, which Beats has been folded into in terms of services, against uh, Spotify. Both services seem to just be growing the music market. And what a what a what a really shrewd move! I wonder though, Chad, do you think it's it's paid off in full, or is there more to come? There's a reason we kind of sequence these clips in in the way that we did. Like, I, I want to go back to the intersection of hardware, software, and services because I think the Beats acquisition, and because we know that Tim thinks of Apple in that way, I think the Beats acquisition makes absolute complete sense. They have this. They have this amazing piece of hardware. Oh yeah, they're kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. you know they're playing at this subscription yeah. service, and then I don't know if you know you remember the Beat subscription service and RDO and a few others that have since you know, bitten the dust. Um, you know, there, mm -hmm. there was there was some kind of interface design yeah. that was maybe interesting or unique in that regard. But Tim was like, you know what? I can amplify all three hardware, software, and services, and get a jump start in 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 that in that world of you know headphones and 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 and, and speaker systems yeah. i think yeah. they took the beats subscription service and launched apple music a year later yeah so yep yep i don't know exactly what the numbers are but i think total number of subscribers to apple music has surpassed all of the other streaming services at this point i don't know about kind of like the you know the the revenue numbers from that but um you know, certainly that's been a success for them. Here's a little quiz for you. Who do you think the third biggest provider of su subscription music online is? If you've got Spotify and Apple Music duking it out in for first and second, who would be your pick for third place? Amazon? Yeah, well done. They are coming on very, very, very well. And I think uh, obviously... Um, the, the Amazon's probably a good answer to, to any question about <laughs> some company that's just doing anything. Yeah. Here's, just, here's the question. Uh, your industry is being very disrupted. Who might it be? Mm. Yes, Amazon. Um, <laughs> yeah, really fascinating. Obviously, the, the Echo and Alexa is all powering uh, that and uh, putting music at your, at, the, at your lips, I guess, would be the the right proverb now yeah the home pod a late a late entrant and in, into that market mm -hmm. you know i was a little surprised how long it took apple especially after the beats acquisition i guess almost four years ago yeah i know and and i'm a little worried that their whole siri thing has has just not really progressed very well i i just think that uh you know, the whole it's a bit too much of a wall garden. You know, they didn't take the open approach at, that Alexa did, where it, where I can, as a non programmer, kind of you know connect my own apps to yeah. to use Alexa. Yep, yep, yep. You're absolutely right there. Um, so we got, I think, some pretty nice little nuggets in that little block deck because we we heard about he saw talent and growth and beats and great point though. It subscribed to his vision of where Apple creates magic, the intersection of hardware, software, and services. And 
you know, I love this sort of this humble team player that he's out to get and he, he wants an absence of bureaucracy and politics. And he has this really clear vision that you have great people executing the strategy and, you know, everything kind of flows from there. But, Chad, we ain't finished with Tim Cook yet. Nope, nope. We've got some more clips where we're going to uh, turn a little inwards and, and learn a little bit more about Tim's personal philosophies and co- kind of how he views things. And this first first one in this this section that we've got is him reflecting on when he was first getting hired by Apple. Is intuition something you're born with or is it something that you've developed over your career so that you, you've kind of refined your instincts? I think it's more the latter. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that you're born with a gut. I think you're, the, the gut matures and, and uh, gets better and better over time. And what the struggle that most people have, I think, is learning to listen to it and uh, figuring out how to access it in some way. Uh, for, for me, though, what I found was that even though I'm an engineer and an analytical person at heart, the most important decisions I've made had nothing to do with any of that. They, they were always based on intuition. And the Apple one is a prime example of that. You know, I, I remember actually forming my list of pluses and minuses, and I could not get the chart to work out the way I wanted it to. <laughs> Because I wanted something to say, you know, this says I should go to Apple, but it would not. There was nothing financially would do that. Uh, I talked to people I trusted that knew me and they said, this is not what you should do. It wasn't so easy. And, And people said, you know, you're just crazy. You're working for the top PC company in the world. How could you even think of doing this? You've lost your mind. And yet, that voice said, go west, young man, go west. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes you just have to go for it. Sometimes you just got to go for it. Doesn't this, at this point, Chad, doesn't Tim Cook really surprise you? Because you just do not expect... Uh, Mr. Get It Done, Mr. Execution, the engineer, the the statesman, just to go, you know what? I just went with my gut on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got chills listening to that one again. I, I think that's my favorite kind of personal yeah. uh, story of his. I mean, I can see him in his cube, or he probably wasn't in, he wasn't in a cube at that point. He, he had an office at IBM. But I can see him in his office at IBM with like his leather, you know, desk set. <laughs> <laughs> with his with his monogrammed like uh, notepad there and the name his, plaque know, at the name plaque at the at the front <laughs> yeah uh, yeah doing his weighted decision matrix whatever you know list for deciding whether to go to Apple or not because you know that's kind of how his engineering brain worked at the time hmm. um, and yet I think this is an example of him at his most entrepreneurial. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but it, it embodies Tim as an entrepreneur best because I see entrepreneurship as m- mitigating risk and maximizing return. And he put himself out there and on the line, like everyone said, you know, this is a horrible decision that yeah. you're making here going to Apple. And yet he was like, you know, I'm, I'm at the market leader now. What, you know, this company may not be the same in five or 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, is there more upside if I go to to Apple? And yeah, we've seen how that's worked out. I know, I know. And this is where it's at this point in the show that he's just like blowing, like setting my mind on fire because you, you build such the, such a kind of calculated view of him. And then this this next clip, this is where he just turns it up even more. I mean, he's like... He, this next bit of advice uh, is great to listen to because, you know, the context here is he's being asked to like, you know, what advice do you have for all these young, amazing people that are sitting in front of you? And I just want our listeners to tune into this because this is quite the unexpected response. I think you should rarely follow the rules. I think you should write the rules. Uh, I think if you do 
uh, follow things in a formulaic manner, you will wind up at best being the same as everybody else. Maybe you missed something in your little wars. And if you want to excel, you can't do that. Uh, I've watched a lot of companies do that, and I, I think that's a rotten strategy. Maybe they'll, they'll be good for a few months or something, but, and so I think you need to write your own rules. That said, I think what this place teaches you so well is how to learn and how to collaborate and how to think about something and how to approach something and how to work with people that have a very different point of view and come from a different perspective than you do. And so all of those things, to me, that was the overwhelming value of being here, not the, the specific rules of marketing or rules of strategy or rules of operations or whatever the, the course may be. Uh, that's what I really think about it. Write your own rules. Mm, th this, I think, is Tim carrying the, the flame of, of Steve Jobs. It, it's an, I think it's kind of a corollary to Steve's think different. Mm -hmm. I, totally, I totally agree. And it kind of... It really kind of grabs you because he's like, he's really pointing to self-determination and, and it's a reminder to all our listeners, hey, don't just follow the rules. Because he goes on to talk a lot about how hard it is. If you just do the same thing as everybody else, it's so hard to stand out, which is so the truth. And uh, I love how he's challenging us, like set your own path, get it done, don't just sort of follow blindly uh, as where every, everyone else goes. And at this point, he's really kind of establishing why we picked him on the show because he's been able to like highlight to us, hey, I've got this clear vision on how to run the company, what I'm looking for in people. I make huge bold moves like the purchase of Beats. Here's the thinking of behind it. And he has the ability to follow his intuition. And hey, this is the guy who's built one of the best supply chains in the world. I mean, Go out there and write your own rules. And I think the the challenge that is in this for all of our audience is, are you just doing what everyone else is doing in your respective field or are you writing your own rules? And I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah, and, and this isn't something wholly new, but I think hearing it from someone like Tim, as you said, is is kind of surprising. You know, I I don't know where the old adage comes from of like, you know, if you don't like the game you're playing, change the rules. But this kind of irreverent spirit was unexpected from Tim, and I'm 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 glad to to hear it from him. Yeah, because it's showing you that to be a operational excellence guru. Uh, you don't just have to be a very conservative, you know, detailed guy. You can be so much more than that. And I, and I, I think that's quite, quite fitting for Apple. And it kind of uh, sets us up to be really positive about the contribution he can make for, I don't know, the next five, ten years, however long he stays there. It fills you with... What a well-rounded guy he is, and and again, Steve Jobs. What what a pick! What a pick for 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 Tim Cook. Mm. Yeah, and got this great clip to kind of round out the show and and bring it on home here. That really just speaks to you know some speculation on what the future of Apple might might be under Tim Cook and the legacy uh, that he will leave behind. He remains the only openly homosexual CEO of a Fortune 500 company which seems shocking, but it's true. His own privacy was becoming outweighed by the need to contribute to a raising of tolerance. He seems to now have moved into other areas as well. He has been very vocal on the aspects of privacy. He has made the company very environmentally responsible, and he famously said something along the lines of, we are trying to leave the world better for our children than it was for us, and if you're not interested in us doing that, you should get out of our stock. When you're out in the wild, you will see Max everywhere now. They're in businesses, they're in coffee shops and airports, and hopefully they're in your living room. Cook occupies a position in business that arguably no other person does. 
Apple has actually performed better financially under Tim Cook than it had under Steve Jobs. So he has a lot of wind behind his sails, if you will, to be able to be in the vanguard. And he wants to use it so that his legacy isn't just supply chains and product development, but also potentially a different way that companies can behave in the world and affect real change. Cue the dramatic ending. Like, geez, we kind of build up some head of steam here. What's what? What do you think, uh, Chad? What What's the the one thing that Tim can most give to Apple based on what you can see right now? The most, the thing I'm looking forward to most is Tim using Apple's profitability to create the change that he and the company and many of us want to see in the world. Um, again, kind of bring it back full circle to talk about some of the things that we don't didn't have clips here on the show. But like he has, I believe that Apple now runs completely on renewable energy sources, you know, through carbon offsets and uh, running their data centers, you know, off of off of you know green power. And then, yeah, as 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 the clip mentions, you know, fighting for equality, human rights, and and privacy. I think those are all uh, really important issues, and the fact that someone at the helm of a company like Apple is, you know, taking a stand on those things is, is encouraging to me. Yeah, it, it is. And, um, he's, he's really started to create a very distinct chapter for Apple and, and it's going to stand on its own, I'm sure. But for, for me, I think it was great. You called it out that, that, uh, the way he decoded the magic in Apple, which is hardware, software services, um, that was a real click for me. I really loved how he, how he kind of put that in place. Um, the top three priorities was pretty awesome for both of us. I think. Yeah, yeah. What what what's going to last with you? What what will you be thinking about tomorrow when you wake up after recording the show? What 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 will you go back to? Do you think, and and think about and noodle on a bit? Uh, thanks to Tim Cook. Well, the other thing is just the the massive financial performance of Apple. Mm. I think we could all, you know, take a look at our our businesses and figure out how to, uh, you know, it's not about how much money you make; it's about how much money you keep. And uh, Tim Cook has found out how to keep what was it two hundred and fifty some odd billion oh dollars gosh. in cash reserves. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, like. I think it takes a, a brilliant mind to f- figure out how to create such amazing products, mm-hmm. ship a billion of them, and, and have that much in uh, in cash reserves. So I think, yeah, the the other lesson is like that people strategy, that product strategy, and, and execution, you know, trilogy. I think is is. I need I need to sleep on what my three uh, priorities <laughs> yeah. are. I'll get back to you on the next you got show. Got homework, like. boy. You got homework. Uh-huh. Um, but we've been doing our homework as well on some future shows to come down the pike, and we've updated our future shows page so everyone can see these. But um, we're going to have a delightful little what would you call a, a sort of an unusual but very exciting format in the next show. We're going to do. Hot. Bringing a friend back to the show. Yes, yes. We're going to bring no Brendan less. Yell back uh, from Startup Grind. Uh, he's going to be back to join us to discuss Hot or Not. And we've got five companies. Do you want to hit, uh, do you want to lead with uh, some of those companies, Chad? Who are we, who are we going to cook up into a big casserole and ask ourselves, are they hot or not? Well, I'm, sp- yeah, I'm speaking to you through your earbuds or car stereos from a WeWork. Ooh. That's one of the companies we're going to, yes. to take a look at. Hot or not. Yeah. I mean, WeWork built an incredible brand, but they're in the tricky old school biz of real estate where people can lose a lot of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. We've got another company that's just launching a new tablet product and it's not apple it's microsoft and their surface go yeah the comeback kids Ooh, something's cooking there i think but then we're going to go to three very mixed bags three companies that i think are presenting some awkwardness perhaps they're just entering into more mature stages or perhaps they're going into more troubled times we got Tesla, Facebook, and Twitter joining WeWork and Microsoft as the topics of our discussion next week, and we'll be asking, are they hot or not? Now, Chad, let's have a little bit of fun with this. Out of the five, 
Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna gonna ask you to tell me who's hot and who's not because that's for the show. But uh, how many of these will we categorize? Will we agree? I think that's what we're gonna do. All three of us have to agree. I'm gonna say two hots and three nots. Ooh, yay, 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 yay. Well, that's uh, that's got me thinking. Ooh, who? Yeah, I can definitely see. I can see one clear hot. And I can see one. Mm, yeah, there's a, there's some. I I think we've deliberately picked some very yeah, contentious. Just, stuff. Yeah, you got to tune in <laughs> to the next show. Now, after that, we've got a really exciting series coming. The great innovation authors and Clay Christensen, Peter Drucker, Simon Sinek, Eric Reese. I can tell you personally, they've all had a huge impact on me. Has one of those that I just mentioned had a significant effect on you chad is there one of those that stands out as your favorite perhaps or the heavyweight well i don't think you can get more heavier weight than peter drucker oh man i don't know a more oft quoted uh guru of people and management yeah yeah and, yeah. and it's dense but his writings on entrepreneurship yeah i think it's kind of the bedrock and foundation for for everyone you know to from Steve Blank to Eric Reese and Clay Christensen, every, everyone else that follows, yeah, I, agree. I think I is agree. is an acolyte and, and follower of of his. I, so I, I'm excited to bring some uh, some quotes mm. uh, for, from Peter to the table. Do you know what's funny is I've based my whole career basically on his central thought that the only thing that matters in a business is product innovation and marketing. Isn't that cool? Yeah, and it's simple, yeah. right? It's just two yeah. things. Those are your two things. But 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 check this out. I use Simon Sinek's uh, golden circles of why more than any other framework in my career. I'm forever using that thing. What do you do? How you do it? Why do you do it? It's, it helps you build a product. It helps you market a product and everywhere in between. Yeah. And then uh, I think for me, it, it might be Clay, Clay Christensen's you know, jobs to be done. Yes. Mental yes. model. Yes. And like it's really hard to forget, you know, the the McDonald's milkshake example, which we'll get to in the show. So yeah, I gotta stay tuned for that. Ooh. <laughs> You're teasing tonight. Well, look, it's been great to to get to the end of the the Apple series with such a surprising offering from current CEO Tim Cook. Really, I got more out of that than I thought. But geez, Chad, I think I say that every single time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always yeah. surprised by what I get out of the show, aren't you? Yeah, it's fun. And uh, I see no signs of, of slowing down in uh, the, the people and companies that we're profiling. So I'm excited. Great, great. Well, um, I want to thank you, Chad. Um, it's just been great uh, to wrap up the Apple series. It's great. We've got a new format. We've got a guest an old friend of the show coming back. Then we're going to launch into our author series. As usual, I'm pretty pumped and really looking forward to to hunting around and bringing you guys a great show uh, for the next show, this Hot or Not. So, Chad, thank you to you. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Where should they be going? Now they're itching uh, to apply some design thinking, some agile thinking, some innovation thinking. Where do they go for all their needs? Well, that would be moonshots.io. And uh, you can s drop us an email at hello at moonshots.io. I'm, I'm curious uh, if you feel like we've left anyone out in this Apple series, or if maybe there's an, an author that you feel like we should be profiling mm -hmm. uh, in our author series. And well, of course, we want to hear your hot or not thoughts on Tesla, Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, oh, yes. and WeWork. So true, so true. All right, Chad, well, listen, thank you once again. Thank you to our audience. It's been wonderful to delve into the world of Apple. We got so much ahead of us. Uh, I wish you well at the beginnings of your day. Are you going to set Brooklyn alight uh, with your storytelling today? I'm not sure what's going to happen. Got, got, got a full day here, but... Uh I'm I'm enjoying the the the, the time swap of uh, recording in the mornings as opposed to the evenings. How are you doing over there in in the the late evening time in Sydney? Well, I, I I'm going to confess to you. I think this is the best way to do the show because you got like a perky boost big time from uh, 
swapping it around to you recording in the mornings and me recording in the evenings. And perhaps I don't talk as much in the <laughs> evenings. So, yeah. so this is probably working out like a perfect <laughs> balance for, for, the, for our listeners. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your cool uh, Sydney evening links. And uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in to today's uh, last show in the Apple series on Tim Cook. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's our wrap from the Moonshots podcast. <laughs>